Well, thanks everyone uh, for tuning in online or, or joining us here in St. Paul uh, or at one of our broadcast sites. Um, this is a part of the uh, Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative um, and the University of Minnesota Extension's uh, forestry webinar series. Uh, so we're really happy to have uh, Dr. Rob Slazak with us here today um, to talk about uh, what he's been working on with the Minnesota Forest Management Guidelines. So uh, there's been a real history of, of the guidelines here in Minnesota. I know Rob will talk about the recent revisions um, that happened a few years ago in 2012 uh, and also sort of the newer uh, guidebook, sort of a, a pocket guide version of the field guide that's um, very good for people that, that work in the woods and they can take out this uh, sort of pocket size uh, field guide fits right in your crew's vest um, and really helps with the guidelines. So for those of you joining us online, uh, feel free to ask questions through the chat box uh, that's on the uh, right-hand side um, of the WebEx system. Uh, and I will be monitoring that throughout the webinar uh, to field questions, uh, RVD clarifications on other sorts of things. So uh, with that, uh, I'll hand it over to Rob. Thanks, Matt. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, thanks for coming today. So, as Matt said, this uh, webinar is very much on the, on the guidelines. Uh, so we're talking about things like, um, if you look at these pictures on this opening slide here, um, up in the upper left you have a log water bar, which is designed to uh, slow the movement of water. Very common BMP that we like to see applied on, on harvest sites with any level of topography. Over on the right, we have a, a landing, which maybe wasn't located in the best area, um, and we rec make recommendations related to that on our guidelines. So very much operational scale practices, um, and in particular focused on um, things related to timber harvesting, but others as well. So uh, just to kind of give you an outline of where we're going down. Yeah. Oh, page down. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so uh, just briefly an overview, it's, it's some context of the forest management guidelines, what they're all about. I'll be talking about this uh, guideline revision process that we just recently wrapped up here um, back in 2012. And then talk about this new field guide that Matt just mentioned, um, give you some details on that in terms of how it's organized, um, various things that we emphasize within it, and really um, kind of what we're hoping to achieve um, with developing it and talk about this new monitoring approach that we're doing and then provide some examples. And because this is a webinar, because it's lunch, I had to include the first irrelevant picture, which is, of course, a picture of lunch. Uh, good Italian beef, if you're into that kind of thing. Hopefully you're eating something as tasty as this. I certainly wouldn't uh, mind eating one right now myself. So with that said, um, when I start off talking about the guidelines, I usually always like to put into context how much work and effort has been put into them. So um, if you're not familiar, these are guidelines were uh, enacted in legislation or called for in legislation back in 1996 and over a three-year process a huge Herculean effort um, was put into place uh, about four technical committees uh, 60 people officially but more close to probably hundreds if not even almost approaching a thousand people in terms of the comments that were um, incorporated into those guidelines and the level of um, resources that were, were put into them but over a three-year process we came up with this initial uh, very comprehensive book uh, which we refer to as, as the Green Book, shown up there in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, in 2005, then, we went and revised the guidelines, um, very comprehensive approach, but it was mostly small kind of internal changes. So these would be things like, uh, you know, maybe the problems with words or formatting, not really large, substantive changes in the actual recommendations. There was a, a request from the legislature for the council to change RMZ guidelines at that time. Um, but the council felt that it was too early after initially developing them, and so they kind of kicked the can down the road. Um, what that did, that set up another series of events then, so we added biomass guidelines in 2007, first in the nation, though other uh, states have now filed with their own. Um, and then in 2012, we did our most recent round of revision, which was um, kicked off by this issue with the RMZ guidelines. Uh, but at the time, we also looked, took a closer look at the guidelines as a whole. and really ended up modifying a broad, broad suite of them. Uh, so just very brief history so you understand that, all the effort that's gone into it. Uh, we still plan on periodically updating these guidelines. It's a living document. So you know, as new technology comes online, as new research becomes available, and also, uh, importantly, as social attitudes change, we'll probably be uh, revising the guidelines again in the future. All right, so if you're not familiar with these guidelines, these are essentially kind of analogous um, practices to BMPs, best management practices. Uh, the difference here, though, is that instead of just uh, like water quality BMPs, which are very commonly applied around the country, our guidelines are much more holistic. So they address things, not just water quality, which is clearly a big base of it, but other resources as well. Air, soil, 
Um, and even things like recreation and, and aesthetics are key components of our guidelines. Um, by and large, we focus a lot on forest harvesting uh, in terms of the practices that we recommend, but there is a much wider range of forest management actions uh, that the guidelines address, everything from site preparation to uh, fire management, road construction, cultural practices such as fertilization, pesticides, and so on. And so we have practices within the guidebook, recommended practices, um, that are considered best practices to manage in all these um, different forest management um, force management type of operations. But again, the, uh, the key one that we really focus on is forest harvesting. And I'll, most of the talk today will be focused on that as well. Okay, so uh, again, guideline revision, uh, the most recent revision we started back in 2010. This is one of the first tasks I was really um, charged with when I started my position in uh, uh, late 2008, early 2009. Um, so we initiated the process in about mid-2010. It was completed right around the end of 2012. So it took about three years to get through it. A lot of um, time, a lot of effort, driving back and forth to Grand Rapids, meeting with the site level committee, which provided guidance, uh, making these changes, uh, many long days that I'm happy to uh, see gone by. Um, but a lot of the details in terms of process and kind of the, the um, way in which we approach the revisions, I'm not gonna get into today. Uh, a lot of that information is available on our website. There's also a, um, a webinar that was conducted by us, if you see, and I believe it's archived on their website, which goes into a lot more detail in terms of you know, the process that we use for guideline revision, things like uh, how we conducted peer review, public review, so on and so forth. Um, and that information is available if you wish to, to peruse it. So today I'm just talking about the, the changes. And we have kind of five, or really four, key categories where most of the changes occurred. And these are infrastructure, which is your landing in road areas. So you can see in this picture here, um, we're looking at a, a road leading up to a landing on a highway. So we're talking about how we've modified guidelines related to that. Uh, biomass harvesting in terms of the, the slash that's available on a site and how that's distributed. And again, in this picture, you can see that. Quite a bit of coarse woody debris. So we have recommendations that were modified related to that. Leaf trees. Um, we had some changes in the leaf tree guidelines as well. Again, we're talking about trees that are retained following harvesting, similar to the one shown in this picture. And then uh, RMZs. As I said before, this is really the kind of the big meat and potatoes of the revision process, and this is where some of the biggest changes were made. Okay, so infrastructure. Again, we're t largely talking about road and landing area. Um, in, in general, these are high impact areas. You know, you have uh, heavy machinery, trucks transporting logs, equipment moving around, can cause generally um, compaction, whether the soil's um, um, dry, wet, frozen. We've seen uh, monitoring over the years that in general, these high impact areas, regardless of the season in which they occur, um, persist on the landscape afterwards. So we generally recommend that the amount of road and landing area be limited to the absolute smallest amount possible within a harvest site to, to conduct your operations efficiently. Um, so that's the base guideline, but we always provided a number because people wanted a number to shoot for, you know, roughly how much uh, infrastructure sh they should have on a site. And our old guidelines said just 3% of the harvest area. So total load and ran landing area should be 3% or less of the total general harvest area. Um, and that, for, for some harvest sizes, that made sense. But you can think of it when a percentage of a, of a small harvest unit, as you get lower and lower in terms of absolute size, it becomes more and more challenging to reach that, that number. So a 10-acre harvest, you, you know, three-tenths of an acre in roads and landing is probably not realistic. So recognizing that and wanting to make sure that the guidelines were achievable, in particular because of the role of certification now, where they take the guidelines as kind of mandatory and you should be able to achieve them, we wanted to make the guideline as realistic as possible. And so we took a look at some of the old monitoring data and came up with these breaks and um, distinctions in, in uh, recommended infrastructure amounts based on harvest size. So you can see here in this table, um, again, for all the old uh, recommendations, it was 3% regardless of the harvest size. Now we've gone to an absolute amount of one acre or less on um, 20 acre sites or smaller. And then 5% of area or less on 20 to 30 acre sizes. And then for greater than 30 acre cuts, we've left it at 3%. And again, these aren't, there's not like a lot of hard data in terms of, um, uh, you know, we didn't do any feasibility studies on what the, the, max, you know, the optimal size of a landing or a road was. These are very much based empirically on breaks in our monitoring data where it seemed like people could achieve them or were more able to achieve them based on best practices. So we don't really think that the numbers are going to change in terms of what people are doing on the ground, but this will increase levels of um, achieving implementation for 
uh, what we recommend. I am having challenges with this. Okay. Technical difficulties. You're right with you. Um, while Matt's figuring that out, so I, I would like to point out that we still recommend absolutely to limit the amount of road and landing area. It's a huge thing. Um, we've been assessing some of the landings now for over 15 years, and there's almost not a speck of vegetation growing on a lot of them. Um, the impacts just really persist for quite a bit of time. Um, so no matter what the guideline is, always try and limit the absolute amount of road and landing area at your harvest site. Okay, biomass harvesting guidelines. Uh, if you're familiar with these, these are essentially we just want to retain some level of fine woody debris on the site. So the FWD acronym is for fine woody debris. Um, and we've generally recommended a third of fine woody debris of the pre-existing stand be retained on site following harvest for a variety of, of reasons uh, related to soil productivity, uh, biodiversity, and so forth. Um, with that said, the, the original recommendation was based on some assumptions about incidental breakage. So that breakage when you, when you harvest a tree and it falls to the ground, how many branches break off? And our past assumptions are that we, you'd get anywhere from 10 to 15 percent incidental breakage. Um, and when we go out into actual harvest sites and just kind of conceptually people work in the woods and see this, they know that that amount varies considerably. And so these <laughs> pictures demonstrate that. So summer pine harvest, uh, you might have almost no slash retained um, for, through incidental breakage versus a winter aspen harvest, especially with older sand conditions, you can have uh, quite a large amount of incidental breakage. And so just recognizing that, we've left it now to be more broad to say, take a look at your site and your conditions and leave something, what you think a third fine woody debris is following harvest, um, allowing some flexibility to account for variations in stand condition. Another thing that change that we've made is to allow deviations for specific silvicultural reasons. This would be things like uh, if you want, need to prepare the site for seedbed um, um, germination, you know, with, with certain types of site preparation, or um, really any, any kind of justifiable silvicultural reason. And these were always inherent to the guidelines before. Flexibility is a key consideration, but they weren't explicitly stated and there was a call to do that, so we added that in. The last one is that we modified our slash guidelines to conform with the biomass guidelines, and that's simply because there was some um, confusion about whether or not retention of fine weed debris guidelines applied to a harvest if it wasn't classified as a, a biomass harvest. And from the site's perspective, it doesn't really care if the material is going for biomass, bioenergy, or if it's going for traditional wood products. It uh, still needs a certain amount of fine woody debris on the site, and so we've um, made our, our slash recommendations conform with the biomass um, retention recommendations um, for conformity between those two, and to clarify that. Okay, RMZ guidelines. So this is the big one again. Um, it was contentious for many years. It's surprising that when we finally got down to this, um, how smoothly it kind of went in terms of the agreement amongst the people who, who uh, came up with these recommendations and the various stakeholders and their support of these. I think a lot of that had to do with the long process that led up to it. Uh, but again, I'm not getting into details about that uh, today. So there were, there were three kind of key things of our RMZ guidelines that changed. One is that in the past, we used to have a distinction between uneven-aged and even-aged management. And uh, actually, the recommendation didn't make much sense. So we had, uh, for uneven-aged management, the recommended RMZ widths are actually much wider than for even-aged management, which if you know uneven-aged and even-aged systems, what they look like afterwards, it's kind of counterintuitive of how you would approach management. So we got rid of that distinction. Um, and now we've also standardized the residual basal area within um, RMZs to 60 square feet per acre. In the past, there was distinctions between um, if it was a trout stream or if it was a um, non-trout stream, where for trout stream it was 60 square feet, for a non-trout it was between 25 and 80 square feet. That number, uh, 60 up here is actually wrong, it was between 25 and 80. Uh, but now just for simplicity and also based on some of the, the research that was reviewed prior to this revision process, the, we've standardized the residual basal area to 60 square feet in all RMZ types. And um, then the third piece, and probably the bigger piece, was that we adopted new RMZ widths. So in this table, it shows how we've broken down uh, RMZ widths. For designated trout streams, um, the old guideline is 150 feet. We've increased that now to 165. Um, for these non-trout streams, less than three feet in width, and small lakes and ponds, they have not changed. They were 50 feet before, and they're 50 feet still now. The big change, um, and we're still trying to kind of assess 
some of the implications related to this is for this middle category because um, trout, non-trout streams greater than 10 feet had a 100 foot recommended buffer before, but the ones that were between three and 10 only had a 50 foot buffer. So it's, it's been a quite a large jump for that one category. It's gone from 50 feet now to 120 feet. Um, similar with the, the um, lakes and wetlands between one and 10 acres, it used to be 50 feet, and now it's gone all the way up to 120. So it's a pretty big jump. It's justifiable. I mean, we manage RMZs not just for water quality, so a lot of the considerations that went into it were things about uh, riparian areas providing other benefits than just water quality, so thinking about wildlife habitat, recreation, again, all those things that we manage for and we're required to manage for in the guidelines. Um, but still, it's a large jump, and so we'll see how it plays out in terms of people implementing it um, down the road. Okay, and leaf trees. This is the last um, big change, so these are trees that we leave on the site following uh, harvesting. Um, structural retention attributes that are largely uh, designed to promote uh, wildlife habitat and also other benefits as well. Uh, certainly have a role in stand uh, dynamics post-harvesting in terms of how the stand regenerates and develops um, following that disturbance. Uh, so there's four changes, three of which were pretty minor and non-issues, one of which was somewhat of a big issue, at least for some, um, some stakeholders. The first one was that uh, in the past we've allowed recommended scattered trees, either 6 to 12 per acre or clumps um, is 5% of the, the harvest area to be used. And somehow people interpreted this that you could only use one or the other. And if you didn't use um, all of one or all of the other that you wouldn't conform with it. And we've just clarified now that you can use a combination um, to achieve the recommendation. We don't really care if you use all scattered or all clumps. It's really just achieving, you know, leaving some structural attributes after the, the harvest. And so now we use a weighted kind of scheme when we assess sites about whether or not um, they've achieved this guideline. The, uh, the second one is that we're emphasizing now, instead of just leaving trees to leave trees, which anecdotally, at least talking with a lot of land managers, this has kind of been pretty common in the past. We now really want managers to be giving some hard thought about what types of trees they're leaving and the configurations that they're leaving them in. So not just leaving trees to leave trees, but leaving trees that will achieve our recommendations, but simultaneously achieve a whole slew of other stuff. So thinking about how you might be retaining specific species that might be more adapted to climate change, or um, retaining a specific configuration that might be more suitable for some uh, wildlife species in, in decline, something along those lines. Giving some real thought to the types of leaves trees leave tree strategies you're using for multi-resource uh, management. I'm going to jump to the last one, which is considering economic value and choosing leave tree. Um, this is in addition to what we've always recommended of a, leaving a range of species, sizes, and conditions, recognizing that depending on what type of species, um, biota or plant, you know, whatever you're talking about, they're all going to have different requirements. And so we want a range of leave tree attributes. Uh, the economic value, the council when they adopted this didn't really provide guidance on what it meant. I'm not going to really provide guidance on what it means either. I'll let you interpret it for what, however you want, but it's now something that you can consider when you're choosing, um, choosing which leaf trees to, to retain. The, the one which was a little bit uh, contentious, and perhaps might still be so for some folks, is that we're now allowing RMZ areas to count towards leaf trees. In the past, uh, RMZ areas were considered as distinct and separate from leaf trees. So even if you had, say, a site surrounded entirely by a stream, which happened to just circle a, a site, um, we'd, still, we'd still expect you to leave trees inside in the interior of that site. And now we're saying, um, in particular with the changes to the RMZ guidelines that were made, where we recognize the, the role that they play in wildlife habitat um, and stand dynamics, that that probably covers a lot of the benefits we're concerned about when we recommend leaving trees. And so now we're allowing RMZs, uh, that area, to count towards the recommended amount of leaf tree area on a harvest site. Some uh, concerns with this, obviously, are as if you have um, a lot of edge and you have RMZs along that, then you might end up with these large, wide open uh, cut areas. I'm not going to debate the relative merits of that. There might be benefits, actually, there, um, certainly with some of the questions we have related to moose now. But uh, regardless, it doesn't seem to be a big issue in Minnesota. I mean, we're the land of 10,000 lakes. You'd think that every single site had a, a lake or a stream associated with it, but in reality, from our monitoring data, it's only about a, a fifth of the sites, 20% or so, have RMZs associated with them. And even when they, in that 20%, about half of those, the RMZ is interior to the site. So maybe a stream bisects a, a, a stand or something. And so really, it's not, you're not ending up with these large, wide open um, 
cut areas without any kind of standing vegetation anyways. But we won't debate that any further. Just a, a little bit of additional context. All right. So that's, a, that's just a quick overview. Again, if you need more information on that, you want to know all the ins and outs of why, I mean, you could go on our website. You could find out the, you know, look up the meeting minutes. You could see about how one committee member was talking a certain point, another committee member was talking another point. You know, follow the whole thing through about how the decisions were made. If you're into that thing and you have a lot of time to waste, that information is available to you. Um, all right, so now switching gears to this quick reference guide. During the, uh, the revision process, during the, the scoping piece of the revision process, we had a lot of recommendations from various stakeholders to simplify the guidelines. Um, I don't have a copy here with me today, but maybe some of you are familiar with our, um, the old gold book, which is the full set of guidelines. It's a very hefty tome of knowledge and information. I'm saying this somewhat sarcastically. I mean, it's, it's got a wealth of information in it, but it's, it's dense and it's um, maybe could be organized in a little bit better ways. And so it was challenging to extract the information out of it that we want people to be aware of when they're in the field, when they're actually thinking about applying these guidelines. And so the council was very much on board with this. It was a big push. We'd always intended to do this after the revision process. And so back in uh, 2013, after, shortly after we finished the, um, the revision, we started initiated a process to develop this, this field guide now, which has been published uh, about I think four months ago, um, started to become available. All right, so I'm going to just give kind of a quick overview of this. There's going to be some trainings actually later in the summer on the field guide if people are interested in that. But I thought it'd be worthwhile since the webinar coincided nicely with the timing in which it was released that we could at least talk a little bit about it today. Um, some caveats before I, I get too into any details on this. And these caveats are incredibly important for developing the, the field guide as a whole too. So we actually have this, this page right at the beginning of the field guide that says clearly what the field guide is and is not. So the, the first thing to point out is that the field guide only contains timber harvesting guidelines. So as I pointed out before, the full guidelines, which are still absolutely available on our website, um, and you can go and you can get those if you're interested in recreation management or road building or whatever. Um, those full guidelines are, are still around, but this field guide is just exclusively focused on timber harvesting guidelines. And again, that's because a lot of people tend to focus on those, and certainly from um, uh, resource management aspect, we think of the time of disturbance, the time of harvest as being kind of the, the most critical period at which resources could be potentially degraded. And so that's what we want people to, to focus on. Um, but it is only those. So if you want more other information, it's in the full guidebook. It's also written primarily for people who use the guidelines in the fields. So this is written for forest managers and loggers primarily, also for private uh, forest landowners. Uh, those are the folks Although there's a lot of other people vested in the guidelines and interested in the ways in which they're applied and implemented, the people who actually do the implementation is that group. And that's the group we wanted to reach. And so it's written primarily for that, that group of, of people. So there isn't a lot of background information. There isn't a lot of supporting information about why we might have a particular guideline. All that additional contextual info that's in the full guidebook, um, just by necessity, if we're going to condense it, you have to get rid of it. And so it's not within the field guide. Uh, but it is still within the full guidebook. So we, we strongly encourage folks to uh, consult the full guidebook, especially if you have questions about why a certain guideline exists or you're looking for content outside of things related to timber harvesting guidelines. Okay, so the way in which it's organized, it's kind of neat. Uh, if you happen to have one handy, I've handed a few out here today. I'm sorry for the rest of you if you don't have one. I can't do the whole, uh, you know, shoot it through the screen thing yet. Maybe in a couple couple years we'll be able to do that but um, if you open up and take a look at it it's organized by by color coded section so you can tab down to the bottom to quickly find each of these these sections that are laid out here um, the, the primary difference with the field guide compared to our guidebook is the guidebook was ordered organized around um, operational practice so there was like a general harvesting guideline section a timber harvesting section a road section recreation so on and so forth and so you'd have a lot of overlap of information across those sections because there was all they always wanted to make sure that um, each section could be a standalone. So avoid that overlap and redundancy. We've organized into topical areas. And the topical areas are, so they're all listed here in this table of contents. Um, and they're pretty intuitive for the way in which people approach some of these questions about which guidelines they might be applying at a certain point um, in time or space with, within the harvest. They're generally more concise, um, but I want to very clearly state the interpretation has not changed. That was one huge 
thing of the council is this was not another guideline revision. It wasn't a revision on top of a revision. Um, the guidelines are absolutely the same between what's in the field guide and what's in the, in the, um, in the full guidebook. If there's some slight uh, discrepancy, it's because there's a change made in words to make it more concise. Um, but the way in which we interpret them has not changed. So um, don't think that there's some, you know, if you get in an argument with somebody about it, oh, this book says this, this says that. The guidebook is the ultimate um, end game, and the, but the field guide should closely, closely mirror that. Having on pictures and graphical examples, again, we want people in the field to quickly be able to look at uh, examples and, and be able to utilize that information. And then um, pocket-sized and water-resistant. <laughs> this last piece is uh, just a little aside. The, the pocket um, size was a huge factor in this field guide. I don't really know why, but for whatever reason, everybody who was involved early on said, oh, it's got to fit in the pocket. And every time I brought an example out for people to review, immediately somebody would take it and try and put it in their pocket. And I was so terrified at the end of when the publication came out that the paper might be a little bit thicker than we've been using or it might be a little bit different, that it was going to be kind of like that O.J. Simpson moment with their try, you know, the glove didn't fit and everything fell apart. And I'm happy to report that that's not the case. It easily fits in your, your pocket. Um, so sorry, just a little aside. Hopefully you can see how funny I thought that was at least. All right, so uh, just kind of run through this then. Um, each of the sections is organized in the same way. So this page on the left is demonstrating that. Uh, this is for the wildlife section, but for each one of them, they have a statement right at the top of it of kind of why that exists, why we have a guideline for that, a group of guidelines related to that. In this case, um, we think health and diversity of wildlife is important and it's dependent upon suitable habitat. That's really the fundamental thing and basis for having these guidelines related to it. And then we go down. And for each of the section, there's key points. I'm pretty sure there's two max. There might be three in one of the sections. But essentially, these key points are things that if, you, if a user was to take these key points and understand them and somehow work to achieve them, you'd probably be doing like 90% of what we're asking you to do within the guidelines. Um, because, I mean, for example here, most of the wildlife-related guidelines are about structural retention. So retain snags, retain leaf trees. Um, retain these structural attributes to maintain habitat. And if somebody did that, even without knowing our guidelines, they'd be far and away uh, close to achieving what we're trying to, uh, to do. The other one here then for at least wildlife is check for uh, basin and threatened species. But each of the topics has these key essential points that we really want to hammer home to users um, so that maybe if they're thinking about a slightly different way to do something, they at least understand what the intent is um, and can then work to achieve what that, what that intended outcome is. Uh, a couple important things in terms of formatting, guidelines are, are highlighted and shown with this um, green check mark symbol um, and bullets associated with those are also guidelines but anything else, if it's just uh, rough information, it's not really a guideline. Uh, in particular these symbols here just kind of rules of thumb appropriately with the symbol of the thumb, um, kind of common sense stuff or, or information that might be useful for quick and easy application of, of a given recommendation. In this case we're talking about front to back skidding which Although it's not really a guideline, we commonly talk about doing it because it can achieve many of the things in which we're, we're trying to um, have occur when people apply other guidelines. I think it's when I'm using the, uh, my apologies for the technological oh. difficulties, I think I gotta stop touching that. So in addition to all that, the other nice thing about the field guide is that there's a lot of value-added content within it. So this is some examples of the, the value-added content that's present in the field guide, things that weren't present in the, the full guidebook. Again, these are very much mirrored, not mirrored, um, formulated to, to be easy for people in the field to use and be able to implement what we're, we're asking them to, uh, to do. So in the upper left-hand corner here, we have um, kind of a range of tree sizes and how many trees you might need to achieve a 60 square feet of basal area. So this is something that associates with our RMZ guidelines. So if somebody had, um, you know, on average a two inch tree, they would have to leave about 3,700 trees per acre in order to achieve our 60 square feet of, of basal area. That, probably not reasonable, but you can start to think about how people could interpolate within this, uh, look at the different tree sizes. And so it's not just number of trees, we also broke it down by spacing. Apparently that might be more intuitive for some folks as well, where they could think of tree spacing rather than total amount per acre. Um, other ones, we have additional emergency information. 
um, related to safety um, and, and various things like spill kits that should be present on a site, the big push in safety um, in general um, over the last decade or so. Things related to soils, this is in particularly important for planning, so going out there's some information now about how you can actually estimate soil texture, which is kind of the key fundamental property of soils that if you understand just a little bit about can go a long way in terms of um, designing your, your uh, um, harvest operation to minimize impacts to soils. Uh, so drainage, drainage class. And then another example is these series of pictures on the right. We had a lot of questions about what's a suitable amount of um, fine woody debris to retain after a biomass harvest. And these pictures kind of show that. It's, it doesn't say which one's right. It's just we, we classify them. So the top one is no slash. The bottom one is some slash, you know, maybe about a third. And then the, uh, or I'm sorry, the middle one is some slash, maybe about a third. And then the bottom one is all slash. And so they, these are just to give a rough idea of what it looks like. And, you know, we want people to be somewhere in the middle um, between those two when they, when they achieve or try to apply our slash retention guidelines. So it's great in that context. The other major thing that we've added in that's not um, at least easily compiled and accessible within the full guidebook is this resource directory where we have a very comprehensive list of a, a lot of resources that folks need uh, when they're in the field. Uh, so an example of that would be this schematic depicting um, the, uh, the, uh, the author regulatory authorities for various agencies when you're dealing with water, um, which may be for some people straightforward if you work within that realm a lot, but you can see here we're already talking about three, four different agencies and they're overlapping. So somebody could quickly look at this and maybe get an idea of who they should be talking to if they need to cross a stream or operate within a wetland. Uh, also a lot of phone numbers for DNR, county contacts, uh, planning resources, you know, links to aerial photos, soil maps, um, endangered and threatened species inventories, or at least contacts for those inventories, and also the sensitive native plant communities. So just a real wealth of information. All right, uh, last thing I'd just like to point out with this is, you know, it was a huge effort. Um, so not only in terms of um, contents, there's an ad hoc committee, the individuals uh, listed on the left here at the bottom of that page, they all were involved in kind of providing guidance to the um, development of the field guide. Um, but also many of the, the institutions and organizations shown up there in the, the left were incredibly important in that they provided funds for the actual publication of this field guide. Our uh, council budget's been somewhat constrained as of late, and so we didn't have the funds to, to print this, and our stakeholders stepped up to the plate and actually contributed funds uh, for the printing of this field guide. Um, so without their contribution, um, it would, wouldn't have been possible. And we're very grateful for it. Uh, other than that, I'd just like to point out, uh, in particular, Charlie Blinn of UMN Extension, Dave Chura, formerly of uh, Minnesota Logger Education Program, and Dick Rossman, the uh, BMP coordinator at DNR Forestry, really play a key role in developing the content, providing review, feedback, and so on in the field guide. And really wanted to thank them. And then uh, lastly, of course, my predecessor, Mike Phillips. Uh, without him, none of it could have been done. He really put together the whole foundation for, for what it's come, come to be today. All right. Um, so availability, if you're sitting in this room, you're holding a hard copy. If you're sitting um, somewhere else, maybe you have a hard copy. Uh, there's been a lot of work that's been uh, done to get these distributed around the state. So DNR, I think some of the regional offices have them. Uh, county land departments have them. The various trade organizations have them. Minnesota Forestry Association. Have, lots of groups have them and, and hopefully they're doing their diligence to distribute them to their various members and, and folks they work with. Um, if you can't, if you don't have a copy, or you don't associate with any of those groups, you can contact us. Rachel Nichols, fantastic staff member at the council. You can contact her via phone or email. The information listed here on the screen, she'll immediately send you out a field guide. Probably even put a little smiley face on it. It's that kind of person. Um, send it off and, uh, and she'll get to you as quickly as possible. Otherwise, an alternative is you could download the, uh, the PDF version from our website. Uh, most smartphones, with the screen size they have now, it displays really nicely at a, a sufficient resolution to, uh, to use it. In fact, I envision in the future this is probably entirely where the, the field guide will go. We probably won't be doing print copies down the line. Um, there's some limitations now where it's not organized as an ebook, so navigating it, if you don't know how to modify PDFs, can be a little challenging, but we're working to, uh, to address some of those issues. All right, that's the field guide, and we're going to shift gears to the last piece of the webinar. So we're talking now about guideline monitoring, in particular um, guideline implementation monitoring.
Uh, this is the third key piece of the, the kind of the site level guideline program. So we have our, our forest management guidelines. We periodically revise and update those guidelines, conduct research related to them. And then the other last piece, at least viewed as being very important from our stakeholders, is monitoring of those guidelines. And there's lots of reasons why people think this is important. Uh, the critical piece I think of it as being important is it just provides us really useful information to identify areas where maybe we could improve. Um, identify areas where we're doing fantastic and identify uh, areas where we maybe need to change the guideline. That infrastructure example I gave you earlier is probably a really good example of that. So I view them as just providing information to improve the overall process. And I think a lot of others do it as well. Um, this has been done since back in uh, early 2000. Uh, in fact, some of the harvest sites were even from before that, 1999. Uh, DNR Forestry does the monitoring. They go out, at least historically, to a very uh, random approach. Uh, statewide across all ownerships, kind of in the shotgun pattern that you see here shown up in that map on the left. And they would go out periodically every other year, every three years, um, or even annually for a period of time and measure about 100 sites um, during a, a campaign. And because of that, they have a couple, over 1,000 sites now that have been monitored within the state. These are generally recently harvested. We like to get people out to the site so they can see what's going on uh, right after the disturbance occurs. And again, we use uh, the results to um, improve improvement or ID areas in, in need of improvement. And periodic reports such as those shown here at the bottom are, are, are produced by Dick Rossman and his predecessor and others. Um, so that was great. That worked fine for a while. Then um, you know, funding got cut. We had to limit funds to the monitoring program. And so for a period of time, the program was kind of in a, uh, at a point of crisis crisis and that it wasn't occurring. Um, and certainly from the council's perspective, viewing how important they view the program, it, it was a crisis and that, you know, monitoring is kind of a key aspect of a voluntary approach and we, we weren't doing it. And so we took that opportunity to really kind of take a hard look at, um, you know, how we could revamp and reorganize the program to not only just acquire a, a funding source, but also really to improve the utility of the information generated from it. And I think we've, we've done a pretty good job. So. Um, what we've done now is instead of going from the statewide random approach across all ownerships, we've started to organize the gathering of information along more um, practical regional units. So we're focusing now on the watershed, uh, in particular focusing on, on water in particular as being one of those key fundamental resources that serves the, the basis for our guidelines. Then we're also incorporating things like um, disturbance metrics, so disturbance patterns, whether it's disturbance generated from forest harvesting, um, natural disturbance. Um, and even land conversion, say converting land to uh, some other um, type. The uh, conversion of potato, from uh, pine to potato is probably a good example of this that's occurring now over in uh, some poor students of the western parts of the state. But we're combining all these three pieces now into this really unified framework that's greatly enhancing um, the information that we're generating in terms of its utility where we can start to target key areas, but also tying us in with Again, this fundamental basis of the guidelines water, which is really kind of the, the key and most pressing issue that we probably face um, in forestry. All right, so the way this works, we're still going out, we're doing field monitoring. Um, we're doing it on an annual basis now, at about 100 sites a year. We accept the differences instead of taking the statewide measurement approach, we're now sampling from watersheds. So we pick three or four Huck 8 level watersheds. These are the major um, administrative watersheds within the state. There's 81 of them. We focus on the primarily forested watersheds of the state. We go out and we do monitoring just like we always did in the past, except now it's just done at the watershed scale. And so we can, once we have those results, our inference can be at the, the watershed scale, which in the past we didn't really have that capacity to do. We then combine that with these forest disturbance patterns, again, by watershed. This is on a biennial uh, time step statewide, but we also do the three to four watersheds um, on an annual time step and we look at these patterns and try to assess essentially where high levels of disturbance are, are occurring. And the idea then is that we can combine those two pieces of information into this third piece of the approach where we combine them into a relative risk assessment. I'll get in a little more detail about what that is. But essentially we're trying to use information from site level monitoring and also disturbance patterns to come up with identifying watersheds that might be at a higher risk of uh, water quality degradation or some kind of impact compared to others. And really, the, so the whole underlying reasoning in this is um, generating information that can be really useful for target education, outreach, and planning. That, that's really the fundamental reason why we want to do this, or why we are doing this. <laughs> 
yeah. So just some examples of kind of how this works. So in the past, you know, so we, so the way in which we do uh, disturbance mapping, we use this little satellite here, Landsat, shown up in the upper right hand corner there. I shouldn't say we use, we just get the, uh, the, the uh, imagery for free. NASA, or actually USGS even, is the one that um, uh, manages that, that platform. But we get the data from Landsat. And then uh, resource assessment out of, out of Grand Rapids uses that information by comparing images from time one and a time two period, and they can actually identify where disturbances have occurred. So uh, this uh, picture up here on the upper left of the slide kind of demonstrates that, where they can go out and identify an individual site. And this is kind of the concept of how we used to do in the past. We used to look at a site, we used to go out and we used to monitor it. Yeah, it's, it's close to water. You might not be able to see, but there's a stream running kind of diagonally through the picture there. We go out, we measure some guidelines, and then we scale and you know average across all those sites, and that would be the end of the story. Well, now what we're hoping to do and are doing is taking that information, starting to scale it up, and looking at disturbances relative to each other. So you can start to go to a slightly larger scale, look at you know proximity of other um, disturbances that are occurring within the watershed, go to an even slightly larger scale, again starting to maybe getting up to the catchment scale, and then looking at the levels of disturbance within the watershed. And then ultimately looking at this larger scale, the Huck 8. And, and again, looking at the patterns of disturbance and, and trying to make sense of how those patterns might relate to, to water quality and other forestry related issues as well. And in the uh, field, we do things, like I said, pretty much exactly the same way we did them in the past. It, the only difference is that we're focusing on the watershed. So. Um, we still use third-party contractors. Dick Rossman, who leads the program, shown here in this picture down on the bottom left, uh, talking to the contractors. They go out, they train those contractors to make sure everybody's on the same page in terms of how they're assessing things in the field. Um, then they go out to a site. They look at things like this middle picture showing a log water bar, and they make judgments about whether or not it's um, installed, if it's installed appropriately. In this case, that's not installed appropriately. It's pretty much ineffective because the logs are not in contact with the soil surface. Um, but they can look at that, whether or not it's operationally effective. And then they put all that information into some of these spatial GIS uh, databases, represented here with that picture in the upper right hand corner, where we can actually outline the harvest site and identify you know, where erosion control is put in and, and RMZs are present and so on. And so we can use that information to start to scale it up to larger scales. You know, again, it passes the site scale, now we can start to scale it up to something of, of greater inference, such as the watershed. All right, so I have some early information, um, data generated from this. This is data that is Jennifer, generated by Jennifer Corcoran, who is a spatial analyst who's working on a lot of the, um, the disturbance metrics and mapping. This is from the period of 2012 to 2014. This is not Landsat, but the concepts and the principles behind it are still the same. So essentially taking a time one and a time two and, and seeing where things have changed. The four watersheds that we did back in um, this last round monitor in 2014 were the Mississippi Headwaters, uh, Lake Superior's north and south, and the Rum River watershed. If you're not familiar with where those are in the state, they're kind of outlined in red up there in the, uh, the picture, the cutoff picture of, of Minnesota. I just want to point out a, a couple things here. So part of the reason of going to the watershed scale is to pick out where the differences exist, right? So in the past, we, we traded, cre treated each site as being equal. But in reality, sites are not always equal, depending upon where they fall. Uh, you know, there's lots of differences in terms of topography, uh, glacial history, soils that are derived from the glacial history, lots of differences in terms of the amount of forest to cover, the amount of lakes. And you can see that present in some of this data. So even the size of the, of the Huck 8 watersheds, there's quite a bit of difference amongst these um, four. In terms of the amount of forest land, uh, you know, Rum River starts to pop out, or uh, a piece of a much smaller amount of the Huggate watershed in the Rum River is forced to compare to others. Uh, things like lakes and ponds and wetlands as well. So, just really just using this to demonstrate kind of why we're at this scale, right? So, there's differences at the scale, and we try to utilize these differences amongst the watershed to, again, come up with some kind of relative assessment of where risks to water quality might be great, where they might be low, or maybe where they're just not, not even existent. Um, given what we're currently doing um, within the watershed. So over this three-year period, we had um, forest disturbance was highest in Mississippi headwaters, 4% uh, of the forested area, and then 2-3% um, in Lake Superior North and South, respectively, and, and less than 1% in the Rum River. So 
three year time period, we're looking at less than 1% of the forested watershed on average. In some cases, a lot less than 1% of the forested watershed is disturbed. Um, much of this is forest harvesting, but there's much of it's not. So the Mississippi headwaters, that 4%, the highest value is actually a big piece of that is from large blowdown event that occurred within that watershed during this time period. Um, so we can actually take into account those different types of disturbance as well and try to assess how they relate to, to water, water quality. And really, again, I'm just showing this as an example of, of how this kind of approach is going to work or how we think it's working and how it's developing into a final product. We look at smaller scales, so the catchment HUP 12 scale, and things look a little bit different. So, you know, before we had um, disturbance rates of maybe 1% or less over annually over the three-year three, three year period, and now we can see that in general over the um, HUC 8 watershed, this is for the Mississippi headwaters, that's true, but there's certainly hot spots that pop out now at this HUC 12 scale. And uh, why those exist? We don't know. It might have been an area that was hit particularly hard by blowdown. Uh, might be a, an area of high harvest activity. Um, might be an area where there's a lot of forest land conversion going on. These are the things that we can just even identify where these hot spots are. We can start to take a closer look and figure out what is driving that and what are the implications of that and if, if the program as a whole can do anything to address it or if it's, if it's even a concern to begin with. You can do the same thing looking at the Rum River. Again, harvest uh, or Disturbance levels generally very low, um, but there's clearly some, some spatial variability with some catchments that are higher than others. All right, so just really quickly, a couple examples then of some site level data. So this is looking at RMZs, where we assessed um, by watershed RMZ implementation rates. So um, these uh, first thing to point out is we're assessing these with the old RMZ guidelines. The um, period of interest overlapped with when we released our new guidelines, so we wanted to monitor based upon what people have probably been using with when the harvest occurred. And you can see some some um, one thing that should pop out pretty quickly and readily apparent to you is that there's some pretty big differences between um, some of the watersheds in terms of compliance. So for three of the watersheds, the Mississippi Headwaters, Lake Superior North and South, Implementation is pretty good, um, and I say pretty good because compared to previous years, we've always had levels of implementation recently between around 70 and 80 percent for RMZ guidelines. And here they're all up above 80, 80 85 percent. Um, in the case of the Mississippi Edwards, 100 percent of the RMZs met or exceeded uh, recommended guidelines. However, there is one huge distinction here, right? I and mean, if you look at the data, the Rum River watershed actually has very low levels of, of um, achieving the recommendations that we, we make for um, RMZ guidelines. And not only that, um, they're low, but even when they're implemented, the, the RMZs are relatively narrow. So there could be lots of reasons why this exists. I mean, one is probably related, some of this is uh, private um, NAPF lands. They might not have the proper information um, to, to know which what the recommendations are, or even that recommendations exist. Um, there could be other reasons as well. I'm not really going to get into them. But the point here that I'm making is that there's clearly differences amongst watershed. And this is what we had, we had thought that we would probably see when we got down to the scale. And really, it, it speaks to the value of going to this approach where now we can say, OK, all these other areas are doing just great. And now we know at a smaller scale where there's an issue. And so now we can start to focus our efforts on improving at that spot rather than saying, oh, we just had this issue statewide. And most everybody else is like, well, what do you mean? We've been doing this fine where, we, where I work. And so now we can use this information to get down to find the spots where there actually is, is a problem. Um, another example, leaf trees. Um, in general, really not a lot of differences amongst leaf trees amongst the watersheds. So uh, implementation rates were 70% um, or so and up which is pretty good for what we've had compared to previous years, 70 to 80%. And certainly, again, you see some watersheds are upwards above 90%. Uh, so doing pretty good there overall. One thing I will point out here is, you know, clumps. We really like people to use clumps. And it's been one of those thorny issues that, for whatever reason, people just don't like to actually use them. And I, I think it's because of the additional cost. You know, there's just more trees usually associated with a clump. But um, it's still one area that we could potentially improve on. And, uh, hopefully, we can start to use this data to identify where we should really be focusing clumps and utilize it for that kind of purposes. Um, interesting to note the variability here. So in particular, the ranges. You've got everything from one tree per acre all the way up to 58, uh, which is quite a, or actually zero trees per acre in the Rum River all the way up to, to 58, which is quite a, quite a range. I'm going to just delve quickly into that a little bit more. Um, 
So in our leaf tree guidelines, we have this, um, this table associated with the scattered leaf trees. I make a quick caveat here. Disre this disregards the point I made up before about you can combine clumps with scattered leaf trees to, to achieve a goal. I'm, here I'm just purely talking about scattered leaf trees. So actual um, the implications in terms of, uh, of implementation are, are a little bit different. With that caveat said, you can see there's, again, there's this quite this high range. So we've got the mean trees per acre across all watersheds. So this is across all four of those that we monitored. It's 17, the median's 12. I don't look at distribution, but the median's probably a better estimate. Um, but we have all the way down to zero, like I just said, all the way up to 58 trees per acre. And what does this mean in terms of what we currently recommend? Well, right now we have this table. I'm not really sure where it came from, but it's, it's one that people like to refer to and talk about in terms of providing guidance on our scattered leaf tree guidelines. So for 80% of these clear cuts, clearly stated right in this figure, 80% of them should have somewhere between 6 and 12 trees per acre. It doesn't say how many trees less than 6 to 12 you should have as a percentage or above. I'm just kind of making an assumption maybe we could split the difference and say 10% below, 10% above as rough targets, starting points. Again, I don't even know where this figure came from, but it's in the guidelines and presumably had some kind of agreement amongst a variety of groups in developing it. Um, so if we look at those percentages and then we actually look at what the data is, uh, we have 25% of the sites are below um, 6 trees per acre, 25 per sites are, are between 6 and 12 trees per acre, and then uh, greater than 50% of the sites are above that 12 trees per acre um, target. I, I don't know what the implications of this are in terms of the actual um, you know, effectiveness on the ground. This could be beneficial. I mean, uh, sometimes there's been a number of studies that have shown a higher leaf tree implementation can have greater benefits for a wider range of species. Um, but disregarding that, it's just showing that the compliance isn't the only number about whether or not you reach this minimum number of six. Is the distribution, the amount we're leaving, um, we're probably not meeting these targets that we've met. Maybe that means the targets need to be readdressed. Um, Maybe not, but it's just an interesting piece of information when you delve in a little bit deeper and, again, highlights kind of what we can start to do with some of this, this data at these finer scales. All right, so real quickly here, hopefully we have some time for a couple questions. Um, this relative risk, I just want to start off by saying, in our perspective, mine certainly, and I think it's well justified from the literature, when we think of risk along a spectrum, forestry is way at the low end of the risk spectrum compared to other land use uh, categories. Um, I'm not going to pick on agriculture, but, well, I just did by even drawing them out, but um, certainly urban land use is probably the worst. You know, you got your concrete parking lots, not that good for water quality with a lot of runoff. Agriculture, with a lot of the practices that we use right now, I think there's generally agreement, at least compared to forestry, um, the risks are, are greater um, where they're relatively less than forestry. So, with that caveat, there's still a risk spectrum within forestry. And so, as the forestry, as a piece of the forestry community, we want to know where those risky sites within forests exist versus where they, they don't. And so we're going to utilize the information I just presented to you to, to identify that spectrum, to look at the forested watersheds within the state and say, okay, which ones are maybe a little bit risky, which ones have no risks associated with them. And we're still developing this, but you could think of it be maybe something along these lines um, where you might just be a simple linear interpretation between, you know, where you have really high or low levels of implementation versus the amount of disturbance. So if you have high levels of disturbance, low levels of implementation, your risk is higher, just on a really simple metric. It may, may not be more complex than that, but it's just one way in which it might be approached. And really what we're focusing on here is, is the pieces that forestry can control, right? We can control what's implemented um, when the harvest occurs in terms of guidelines. And we can also control, at least to some extent, the disturbance patterns, at least the harvest-related portion to it. Um, and so since we have control over these, these are the, the variables that we, we focus on recognizing that if, if we do need to, to change and modify what's occurring with them, we can actually do that. It's not something that's out of our control, innate to the watershed, something like soils or, or something like that. All right, so the key objective of this, and really just highlighting this, is we want to maintain the supply of high quality water from forests. Forests are fantastic land use for water quality. I think a lot of the MPCA's efforts at monitoring so far have highlighted this. The forestry community has known this for a long time, and we just really want to keep forested areas forested and maintain the, the supplies of high quality water from them. So all these other factors are kind of feed off of that, but um, if we can achieve all the rest of them, then we think that we'll hopefully be able to achieve the supply of high quality water, which is our primary objective in doing this. 
Okay, a couple upcoming training sessions. Um, these dates, if you're interested in, in training on the guidelines or have any kind of training needs, I believe most of these are highlighted on SFEC's uh, web pages. There'll be announcements going on about them. Keep them in mind. Sorry, I went a little bit over. I wanted to leave more time for questions, uh, but we do have some time here. Um, and of course, since I started out with one irrelevant picture, I have to end with another irrelevant picture. Um, it's Tuesday, it's cat day. Um, certainly, it's a great question. That is kind of the underlying idea that initially led into the development of this approach. Conceptually, there's thresholds for everything, right? So you need to reach some point, and eventually you have some kind of response. And the idea here is if you have land conversion or, or some recent level of disturbance, that eventually might have a response, in particular in, in the amount of water flow. There's been some work by Sandy Vary and others up in small catchments, even small in catch. Uh, up 12s, really small basins. They've shown you only know, get maybe above 60% um, recent disturbance. You can get a large increase in in, um, in uh, stream flow. So, yes, we recognize that. We're not looking for an actual number here, though. Really, what we're trying to do is just initially assess what those patterns are, and then maybe down the line start to pair with uh, efforts by a PCA where they're doing some water quality monitoring at the how. Eight scale or the um, HUC 12 scale pair with where they're doing uh, stream flow monitoring and so maybe over time empirically be able to identify what some of those thresholds are um, but right now we're simply using it as a way to just identify wh what those disturbance patterns are and starting to make sense of what they mean and just to comment you made a comment uh, in closing about things that forestry has an impact on and we were talking about harvesting uh, happening and you don't really have a lot of control over whether harvest happens on non-industrial private lands. I mean, you certainly do on state and federal lands. True. It's a great comment. And really the, the approach we're, we're thinking now, and again, we, we don't even know when we'd be approaching a point where we'd really want to take a hard look at that. This is kind of just the initial setting the foundation for it. But um, the idea would be you know, we, we can work with the existing planning efforts at, say, like DNR, like their SFRMP planning process, or work with the feds, or, or any of the other large landholders um, for some coordinated planning. And at the same time, there's a lot of other uh, watershed-based organizations that do bring in some of the private landowners. And so if we, we know where those are, then we can start to at least reach out to the private landowners. Maybe have some discussions about if there's possibilities for altering plans or anything. Is there uh, any efforts to, out there to uh, for the feds to uh, take a look at culvert discharges, roads, as far as point source um, impacts, anything like that? No, there was a recent uh, court decision that reaffirmed that culverts are that not. For, for now, I think there's still, there's an appeal and it's hanging around, but for now they reaffirmed that um, forest roads, culverts are not point sources. A uh, question from Grand Rapids. Um, you mentioned Run River specifically, um, and sort of the lower compliance relative to some of the other watersheds you studied. So what sort of steps are being taken there to 
maybe improve some of those compliance numbers. So how might the council use that or the DNR use that uh, in the future? So that, that's a great question. And again, I'll reiterate, this is very preliminary data. Um, so we just got this. It's just been worked up. Uh, we haven't really even done any efforts at all in terms of looking at reaching out to Rum River and figuring out even why that occurred and then also figuring out what steps we can do to, to modify it. This is very much kind of the first initial step. Um, and really why I presented that information in this webinar was to demonstrate the utility of going to this watershed-based approach. Right, because in the past we've always had we had maybe low levels of our Z implementation, and at least me when I would go around to various uh, parts of the state, people would be like, "What are you talking about? We do a fantastic job on our MZs. and you know you go out to some places and be like, "Oh yeah, these look great," but I don't I don't know. You know, our data says they're not so good. Well, now we know, at least for this past year, maybe part of the reason might be there's some hot spots where there's there's no work going on related to that. So that, that's why I presented that. But it's a good question, and ultimately we'll be using this data and this information going forward to figure out where we have to put our efforts and, and then figure out strategies to address that. And it'll probably be things like working with, um, you know, landscape committees, uh, regional landscape committees to get out some information in terms of outreach and planning. Also be reaching out to specific uh, watershed groups, with the Rum River, I'm not sure exactly what those might be, but I'm sure they have some with the uh, Lox there. And, and so things along those lines. And another one, just to clarify, the printing of the guidelines versus the pocket guide. And so the newer version of the guidelines, the 500 page or so, so that's printed and available for folks too, or it's not. So that's the only the PDF version. Yeah, the new guidelines, uh, the revised ones that were completed in 2012 are only available electronically. There's just no way we we're going to be able to print that book off. Not only that, and from a practical standpoint, it doesn't make sense, but there's no way we could financially do it either. So that's available as a PDF similar to how the guidelines were available before. It's available on our website. It's a little bit tough to find right now. We're working on updating our website. Actually, right now we have a web designer who's, who's working on that. Um, so the only thing that's available in hard copy is the field guide right now. And maybe one, one final question. You mentioned some of the on-site um, guideline trainings that are available. To my knowledge, there's also trainings available online uh, also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is um, online training. There's introductory training. You can get to it through the um, Minnesota Logger Education Program's website. It has a link to it. The, the training is actually hosted on um, UMN servers. One caveat note I'll make about that is that the training is, is outdated. So it's pre-revision. It's still a very useful product in that it gives a very uh, good uh, introduction to the basis and the reasons why we had the guidelines highlight some of the most important ones. But there's details related in particular to RMZs, um, page references most notably that are just totally inaccurate. We're working hopefully with DNR to try and secure some funds to, uh, to update that training, but so far I've been uh, unsuccessful at acquiring that. Uh, very good. Well, everybody thank Rob uh, virtually online or here in St. Paul. Great, and so uh, SFECs and extensions next for your webinar will be May 19th. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, have some staff from the Minnesota Department of Health here uh, talking about vector-borne diseases. So tick season is coming, and uh, a lot of people are interested in that topic too. Uh, so again, thanks everyone for joining us, and we'll see you next month.